Sure, may as well. Right. Sure. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about uploads and downloads. And so I was going to take the brunt of the presentation on that. Um, I don't know if it's going to go the whole time. It might not. So um, if not, then we can use the other time to, you know, either call the session or ask questions or, or so on and so forth. So I'm just going to get started here. Share my screen. Desktop two. All right. Can everybody see the book? Okay, are the review materials. So um, tonight we're going to talk about uploads and downloads. Um, I've been kind of like, I've been kind of following John Harmon's lead here a little bit and trying to create some learning objectives for each of these sessions to kind of keep us focused and um, kind of keep us like what we should be learning from the chapter. And so I put these together. And so I think tonight what we're really going to cover is how do we include upload and download functionality into our Shiny apps. We're also going to talk about what are some of the elements that are required both in the UI and the server to get this functionality to work. And then we're going to discuss how those two interact together to make this functionality work. And then we're going to uh, develop an app that validates the user's inputs based on that upload. And then I got a couple of examples that I'm going to share tonight to kind of highlight this functionality and how to kind of get it to work. Um, again, I don't think it's going to take the whole session tonight, but again, you know, if we have questions, definitely jump in. And, and I have a couple of questions that, I, that I'm going to aim towards Kevin because I know he, he's done this before. And so there was a couple of questions that I had when I was putting this together that I think um, you might be better, best to answer them. So let's kind of start off with uh, the first part of the, the book or the chapter um, was really talking about file uploads. And... The UI, it really talks about and splits it up into the UI and the server. And so when it was discussing this, the one function that we use to build in the file upload is this file input. Uh, at its core, there's two arguments that you have to specify is the ID and the label. ID obviously gets passed on as an input into your server to which you can use to do whatever you want to do with that data that gets imported from the user. And then your label just changes the label of the actual, or changes the label that uh, the user sees in the UI. There's some other arguments that were discussed with this function. Uh, there was the multiple argument, which allows you to, or gives your user the functionality to add more than one file. And then the other one, which was accept, which I thought was kind of interesting because Except it's kind of like a validation to make sure that the correct file format is getting uploaded by your user. However, there was a little caveat with this accept function, that being that it depends on the browser. So sometimes some browsers restrict, if you have the accept function set up for file input, it will restrict the type of files that you can, but other browsers will not. Now, I use a Chrome browser, and I was kind of playing around with it with some of my examples. Chrome did this, but I didn't test other browsers. So I was interested. I was going to get Firefox, and I, well, I can't do, um, is it Internet Explorer anymore? Or maybe it's Edge. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't really kind of test that out. But the book really talks about that you should be on just setting this accept variable or this accept argument. You really should focus on doing validation inside of your app just beyond this argument because you know who knows if this if your app's public facing who knows what uh browser people might be using so with well, this gonna, yeah go ahead I, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt uh oh, what i was going to extend i think in firefox and chrome i'm 90 percent sure 99 percent sure of this you can uh i think it's an extension or it's a system setting where you can spoof the server. So you can replicate, like a lot of the times you'll have server side that uh, looks at your browser style and then chooses which type of argument to pass. That's a, it's a, it's a client server side uh, architecture. But um, I think I'm pretty sure in Chrome and Firefox, there's an extension or a setting within the undertone of the browser that allows you to switch different web-based protocols. So it's like you can have a Chrome browser, but actually it acts like Internet Explorer. Um, I don't know if that means anything to the team or if that would be something of support in, in doing uh, validation testing of some of this service. Uh, you don't, 
I don't recommend having 18 different styles of browsers on your computer. That's usually not a good sign. But um, like I said, I think it's Chrome and Firefox for sure. Um, I don't know if the other open source browsers have that same feature or not. Yeah, and, and I think I think really kind of what the book was getting at is like, yeah, this argument's available to you, but don't always trust it because you don't necessarily know, you know, if it if your app's going out in the world, you don't necessarily know. And my guess is is that users will try and input anything into here. So you might require a CSV, and you know, Kevin shaking his head on this. Someone might be like, well, I'm going to input my, you know, my ping of my dog, you know, or a, a ping file picture of my dog and see what happens. And, you know, it, and I mean, also too, on side of it too, malicious intent too. Um, you know, there are users out there. If you have a public facing app that may, you know, try and hijack the back end of your application and they may try and do, you know, things like SQL injection, if you have it connected to a database. And so, it's just kind of a good thing and we'll get to security. Well, and again, I'm not a security expert by any means, but it's good to have like that double check, have that accept argument set and then have that validation within your application. Because one, you have users who will try anything and you have users that may have a malicious intent to try and take down your application. Yeah, I've broken stuff just, you know, when you have like spreadsheet files and you know, you just kind of miss it and you try to upload an Excel file and it wipes out a database table. It's not fun. <laughs> and I'm like, I was always like, I, I've heard you kind of say that a couple of times and I'm just kind of interested. Was it like, did you have like a SQL query that was embedded in it? Or like, I mean, if you can't share, like it I wasn't my it. app, it's not. Kevin, we, we lost your mic again. There Sorry about that. I don't know what I'm doing to do that. But no, it's it's an app we I use at work. It's not a shiny thing. It's just a, but it is a SQL based app. And it the the MIS person is like, I don't know why I had to delete the files of because it's usually supposed to overwrite, but it you know in an Excel file it'd wipe out a database table. And so we put a stop to that. But you know, if you accidentally put up a Excel file and wipe it out, the database table, the whole payroll files. So thank goodness for backups, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and you hope at that moment your database administrator is uh, doing their job and doing their due diligence. So, um, but yeah. So with that, I mean, again, you know, add in validation outside of this accept. But you know, again, there's this accept argument that you can have. Uh, traditional file extensions like CSV, TSV, RDS. Um, you can also limit it by MIME type. And, you know, I'm not really familiar with this format outside of it being a, um, a picture format. So like, well, I shouldn't say just picture because you can have JSON or PNG. And then um, other ones like audio, video, or image, you know, again, it can accept many different files. I mean, when we say data, we say data loosely because it could be any types of data. It could be photos too, if you wanted to create an application to do that. There's other arguments that are available to you. Again, if you're interested, just look in that question mark file input. That's a great way to kind of get more information about all the different arguments that are available for that. Now on the server side, it's a little different. So in the server, we're working with a data frame um, and I'm going to share an example with you. I'm going to share the example with you here in a second, but it's a special, it's a data frame of a special structure that has four different columns. When we, when a user uploads a file and specifically we're going to look at a CSV file, it's going to give us the name of the file. It's going to give us the size. Uh, and then again, it defaults to five megabytes, which you can adjust. So if you want to give your users the capability to do a 10 gig file and you have the resources to process that, you can change that. Uh, it also has the Shiny Max request size option that you can change to change the size, the type, which is the MIME type, and then the data path where the data is actually stored, which is a temporary file um, for the application. So I'm gonna kind of bring in our first example for the tonight. Um, if you're ever interested in accessing these, if you go to the book or the, um, the uh, resources that are available, 
uh, for the like the review materials. If you go to the book club M Shiny and look in the example section, there's a whole bunch of different examples for you to access if you ever like interested in seeing how something works. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you kind of the app upload. So in our case right here, here's our file input. Again, it's in our UI. All this does is it just creates the UI element. Uh, for this application, I've decided to use accept to only take in a CSV file, TSV file. Again, include validation, which we'll talk about here down on the bottom. But this accept should limit the types of files. Should be kind of like that first checkpoint for the files that get uploaded. And then, you know, the placeholder argument which says, hey, just give me some data. Uh, and we'll show that in a second. And I do give the user ability to do multiple files, although I'm only going to share one. The book also talks about, and we're going to flip over to the server side with this example right here. The book really mentions that when you do have an upload, what you should include is you should include that rec function. Uh, again, because you don't want, you, you want to pause the app. You want to pause the app for a second before um, any input is provided. And so what we do here is we provide a rec and the requirement for this is that input upload. So we're actually pausing execution until our user gives us the file that we want to process and do whatever we want with it. So the other thing uh, right here was the validation. And so this is kind of like our second check to kind of that second checkpoint for the data that gets uploaded. And the book talks about this, uh, this function from the tools package, which is file extension. All this really does is it just pulls out the file extension. And in our case, it's gonna be a CSV and it saves it in this kind of object called extension. And then it does some error handling where it's like, it takes this extension. And this was the first time that I actually understood what switch does. I was like, oh, I really get what switch does. But it's kind of like, a, hopefully I'm not gonna, I don't wanna say it incorrectly. It's kind of like a more, it's kind of like a, a, a more flexible if else way to handle errors. And so what it's doing is switch is taking in this extension object and then it's passing it along and it's saying, hey, if it's a CSV extension, run the import through Vroom and then use this data path to pull it in and our delimiter is gonna be a comma. If it's a TSV extension, use Vroom at this data path and it's gonna be, and our data file is gonna be delimited or tab delimited. If we ever receive anything that is not of a CSV or TSV, validate's going to push a message that says, hey, this is an invalid file, uh, stop. You know, you needed to put a CSV or TSV file in. Uh, to kind of complete the app, all it does at the end is it just takes our data, which is now a reactive, and it outputs the, you know, the first six um, elements of that object. So let's take this application for a spin, take a look at it, so here's our simple application. All we have is just an input uh, where we can upload a file. We click browse. And then again, um, it's going to open it up. I'm going to take this empty car CSV file, plug it in, it uploads it, and then it just displays the data right here. OK. What questions does anybody have about how this application works or inputs in general? I wonder with the Vroom, Colin, is Vroom doing like sanitation check. So like if it doesn't have a delimiter of a comma or a, a tab uh, uh, value, let's just say you took a PNG file and just renamed the file to CSV. And then the validation is obviously going to pass. You're going to upload some gibberish, right? Because it doesn't meet the delimiting marks. Does that error out? Have you tried that or tested with that? I have not, but... Fortunately, I do have an RDS file in here with an RDS extension. Well, here, here's my here's the first thing, this first check, because I have the, the accept only set to TSV, CSV. It's not allowing me, because my browser is not allowing me to do this, because the first check is not allowing me to take in an RDS file. But we can stop that by taking this out. Then we can run it run the application, browse, look but at Ryan, RDS. You're talking, you're talking about if there's a file with 
with an acceptable extension. Yeah. So uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Windows here. So yeah, Windows yeah. is kind of a dumb program, right? And so if you, as a user, happen to save the file of CSV, let's just talk about the malicious security side that Colin had mentioned. If I had a malware and I wanted to, I, I realized that the uh, input server only accepts CSV and TSV because that's what we're telling it to accept. If we send it something of other garbage, what is an additional step of uh, what, I guess what Vroom is doing to do a sanity check of the media if it doesn't have a comma or a tab delimited form, then does it automatically error out and ignore the file or you know pass something back to them? And I'm sorry, I didn't actually look at the Vroom uh, uh, extension to see exactly what that code is doing, but. I mean, that's a good question. Um, I mean, well, well, the first thing that I was kind of interested in is you have that first check of accept, you have the second validation check, which would be this file extension. So I don't, and that's why I was digging into this file extension and wondering if it, you know, if that's like your next check, if it like forces that extension check, I might have to dig in to understand it. But Vroom, I am not sure because technically what I think this is saying, and again, it, I, I'm not, I don't use switch a lot, yeah. um, is I think is it's like extension is CSV. So, I mean, as long as you had that extension as .csv, it might not do, I guess, what you're you're asking. If the limiting maybe the actual, yeah, the parsing piece of it, right? The, how it's actually separating the file as it enters the data frame. Um, Ryan, to your statement, so my, my comment, I, I always think about Windows as the more unsecure service of, of most web servers. I have nothing to say negative towards Windows. I don't want any uh, hate mail for making comments towards Windows. It has ways of bypassing even the best of protocols due to the structure of how it handles media. In a Unix or a, a Linux type service, uh, if it doesn't lock in exactly what that extension says, you don't even have an option to do anything with it. It won't. It won't even accept it. Um, and so that I always think about uh, uh, extension spoofing, and this is one of those ways. If we're giving the option of ingesting media from an unknown source, possibly an unsecure source, and a malware is modified by the file extension, how does the server react to that? What would be uh, uh, a uh, point? I won't drag it any further. I'll, I'll go do look some research myself. Well, I, I just did it. I just, I took a picture. Uh, it was okay. a PNG and I changed it to a CSV. And then I tried to upload it and it just said uh, error invalid multi-byte string element one so yep you know. so that tells me the delimiting mark uh so you're do you remember that that comment colin you made about the the bit chunk um what you're doing during that process of upload it's not taking it as a, an entire file right uh what you're doing is is actually chunking that section out so if you had this really long string ryan that that png is just a bunch of characters right hexadecimal values rbg values um <laughs> as it's streaming up and it's trying to parse it, looking for that delimiter, it says, holy crap, I've got five megabytes here and I haven't even reached a comma yet. Um, this has got to be an error. And that 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 uh, bitwise error is probably a good indication of, of why it wouldn't accept it. So, good thought. I mean, I think these are all good points because, you know, I, at the same time, you know, I keep thinking about that. It's not me going to be using this application. It's going to be other people using this application. And whether that be somebody <clears throat> who has the best intentions or the worst intentions, you know, what are the steps that you're going to use to validate all of those steps? And, you know, um, I, I, you know, I guess it comes down to like what kind of coverage you have to do that. Right. And so there's different steps that you need to take to do that, both with the accept function or the accept argument <clears throat> and then this file extension. And then, you know, and I guess it comes, comes into a balance too. Are you going to be able to stop? everything because there's probably some like really crazy thing that somebody would try to do that you can't even account for some of those corner cases so i don't know but i'm not a developer and and i and i couldn't you know say like what is the crazy things that people are going to do so here's a question i had so when we upload in this in this toy example from the book when we upload to the server this is just a server that's on our 
that's on our local machine, right? I mean, obviously that's not like, it's not out on the internet somewhere. <clears throat> so then when we close this, does that, does that file still exist somewhere in some kind of a server like location on the, on a desktop? It would take up storage space, yes, but it would probably be in a temporary directory. Uh, and so there would be no cost related. It temp directories usually get purged uh, if, if you go through a system reboot or, or you know some kind of garbage control. Um, but yes, as far as answering the question of that upload from your computer into your own computer, that yeah. workflow of, of acceptance, yes, it is. Uh, your server itself is taking up temporary space uh, or, or hard drive space for sure. And it exists only until you you end the session with the server, and then it becomes marked for deletion and, and overwriting and so on. I think what, what I would answer it with is persistent versus non-persistent memory. So in most server applications like R and Shiny, uh, uh, as it, as it uh, uh, kicks out that, um, it's considered a non-persistent memory. So yes, it's taking up the space and the time that it's running. As soon as you collapse or, or end that process ID, anything related to it is also uh, purged as well. Um, that's a, I don't, I don't want to take us down the pathway of garbage collection, but um, that's actually what's going on kind of behind the scenes, even, even at an under layer behind the Windows operating system or uh, Unix operating system. And, that, and that's a good segue because what I was going to do next is like, well, let's let's dig into this a little bit. Let's see what's happening. And so what you can do is you can throw a breakpoint right before the switch so that we can kind of play around with it and look at the data object that's available. And so if I run this and I first have to do an upload, so I have the application running over here. So I have to upload some data before the browser will actually, before the debugging browser will work. So let's do empty cars. So now I get kicked into the interactive browser here. And so we can actually start looking at the input uh, upload here and we can start getting a sense of what this data looks like. So we can do this, we can do stir structure, look at input, look at upload, and then it's gonna give you those four elements that the book talks about, like your name, the size of it, the type, which is text CSV. And here's the data path to which it which the data gets stored. Now I say that loosely and Ryan, you might have, you have, yeah. might have to uh, support me on that, but I think this is the temp file to which it's getting stored. It would be. And actually you could, you could go search for that if you chose to uh, uh, call in. Uh, so your var directory is usually some form of a variable directory. It changes in scale and size, et cetera. Uh, all log data is usually stored in var. So if, and I know Colin's using a, a, a Mac computer, Unix based, BSD based. So the var directory folders directory exists on his computer. Then underneath there would be the dash four and then some other gibberish number, which is assigned by the, the operating system itself. What I wanted to, to really focus Ryan and, and Kevin's attention on, or, or Colin, if you notice it uh, about halfway through that uh, URL, uh, you get the double forward slash and it says RTMP uh, and then some number. I don't know if that's R temp uh, or if that could just be, um, uh, unique. Uh, well, yeah, coincidental that it's it's named R temp, but um, that you, you're you're taking up memory space, yes. But the operating system and the server itself is managing that um, that uh, handling of that uh, media type or that that extension. It does have. You could go and 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 literally copy that uh, uh, var folders all the way to the end of CSV. Uh, go into Finder and navigate to that point, you would probably be able to open the same file that he just uploaded. Well, that's what that's what I was wondering. Like I was, I mean, I'm not going to spend time doing it, but I was wondering if I sure. could like find that var folder. And I mean, right. Right, I, I mean, I don't want to be exploring my files, you know, well, I mean, <laughs> over our recording. No, but. that's okay. Uh, what, what I was going to mention, and I'm sorry for, for taking this much, but um, the var directory is a unique Bold, or a, neat, a unique directory, and make sure I use the right vocabulary. It is a unique directory within the Unix operating system that is intended to store temporary media type. So um, when I mentioned log data, 
anything, everything related to Linux, uh, Mac, your iOS operating system, your phone, your, your Android phone, it will always have a var directory. So in Ryan, your case with having your uh, uh, Windows based operating system, uh, go into your dot app uh, from, the, from the user documents, inside documents will be a dot app. Inside there, you would have all of your temp data. And that's kind of a similar-esque way of explaining what the var directory is. Um, var is very critical into web development or web server. Uh, that's actually where you store your www folder, and then it sim links back to the other part of the server that anybody can't touch. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wormhole. Uh, it's blocked. So. See, and it's, it's, I mean, like, I know I'm digging in this. I'm really like nerding out on this right now because like, I'm just, you know, I know there's a bar folder. And so I'm like, I just want to, I mean, you know, the question is for me too, is because we stopped execution here with that breakpoint, Right. And so we haven't imported this into the app environment yet. Good point. So in I that think, case, this yeah. would just be populating your, your URL path or your, your namespace path of where it would store at then. Yeah. That's a great comment. So, I mean, I guess the biggest point here to remember is because we breakpointed this here and because we're going to do this next check right here for the CSV, like we can check that extension variable in our interactive to browser and it should be CSV. And that's what the, that's the object right there that gets used to check in the switch and go to Vroom. So, cool. <laughs> That was a that was a good conversation because it, I mean there's a lot here beyond just like oh you give your user functionality to upload it and so <clears throat> excuse me um, doing that answered my question about what that where that dollar sign data path was coming from yeah I mean it's just on the input right like it's the input it's, it's upload part of the data frame like when you put the the stir function it's right there. I was wondering where that was coming from. And the other thing that's cool about this too is like what you can do is you can actually, you can actually take this whole thing and run it. Like if you wanted to, you could just take this out in your interactive browser, run it and see what the data object will look like. So you can kind of do a little bit of testing here in the interactive browser, kind of pausing the execution. So I thought that was kind of cool. And so, Take it for what it's worth. <laughs> um, okay, cool, excellent. That's that's great discussion. I learned a lot. So, um, so then we talked about breakpoints. So let's talk about downloads. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I thought I heard somebody wanted to say something here. Uh, okay, why is the book? Oh, because I'm in an interactive browser. Duh. Um, so, okay, so I should be able to go now. Okay, good. So I'm, I'm running, I'm running a, the book. So it's weird because I'm running the book as well on a web server. And then I'm also running those applications. So because I was an interactive browser, I couldn't switch back and forth. So, um, so we can also give functionality to our users to actually download data. Uh, we're gonna talk about the separation between the UI and server. It's pretty much similar to file upload. We can either give them a down, we can give the user either a download button or a download link. And so it's the same kind of foundation. You give it an ID as an input, and then you can provide some label. There are more options available to you. You know, just do that question mark download button to get all the different options. But some ones that you might change is the class or the icon. So that will just change the appearance of it. And but what's important about this is the server with the download giving functionality of, of download for your user is a little bit different because now what we need to use is we need to use this function called download handler. And with download handler, there's two required arguments that we need to use and that's file name and content. However, the input into file name and content of this uh, function needs to be functions. And so to kind of split this apart, this first, the, you know, for the first argument, we provided a function that creates the file name that we want to uh, give to that file. And then we actually do this next function, which is the content, which we provide the file that we want 
the user to be able to download. And then we use the function to, you know, whatever we want to do. In this case, we're going to write a CSV file to our user's computer. And so the biggest thing about this is just knowing that you need to provide, and I say this loosely because there's an example that doesn't use a function for this, but the book says, hey, for both of these arguments, you need to use a function. So, uh, so let's jump over to our, let's see here. Yeah. So I kind of created a diagram. I won't go into this diagram too much, but I kind of plotted out in my mind a little bit about what I thought was actually happening. And you can kind of look through this and kind of see it. But really, it, it comes down to that, um, you know, the user either uploads data, manipulates it, explores it, and then has the ability to pull it down. And again, you could output many different file types, right? It could be a CSV. It could be any date, you know, it could be a tab delimited. It could be a ping. It could be any file type that you really want to. You just have to be able to use that download handler and have the capability of being able to output that file. So go ahead. Somebody have a question? Oh, I must have like a must, must have some like static because I keep I think, keep hearing somebody want to ask a question. So, but if you do, just jump in. Um, tell the user download a file containing based on their uh oh yeah so the user kind of explores their data whatever and then they say hey this is a really cool view of my data this is a really co cool plot that i want to download you can give them that functionality again you can either do a csv or tsv the book talks about um, exporting a tsv um you have to i i kind of thought of it as like think of your user base uh if you are going to have it public facing and you know that you're going to have a global audience accessing it um, you got to remember that there's differences across countries. So, um, you know, I, in more European countries, they use um, TSV files because they signify big numbers with a, with our decimal places with a comma rather than a period. And so the book says you should use TSV, but I kind of went back and said, well, in my mind, I was like, well, think about your users. If it's mainly going to be internal here in the United States, maybe you could get away with the CSV. But if you're opening it up to a larger global audience, potentially do TSV. And then you can also do other, you know, content types as well, like a ping or, or whatever file type you want. So let's, uh, let's take another app for a spin. This one, we're going to do the app download. And so um, this one's a little bit more, uh, there's a little bit more functionality. I'm going to kind of talk about big picture what this app does. Uh, all I really do here is I create like a simple filtering app. Uh, I use file input, so I'm going to allow my user to upload a file, and then what I'm going to have them do is I'm going to select a couple inputs to help them filter that file, and so and then I'm going to have them click an action button to say, hey, I do want to filter this data. I'm going to give them a table output, and then I'm also going to give them a download button to say, hey, if they like the way this table looks, they can download it. Some of the some I'm using some of the similar stuff that we've talked about before. I have a rec uh, right here, obviously requiring that my user give me data before they can, or they give me data to or they. I pause execution before um, the data is inputted. I check the file extension because I want to make sure that my users are giving me a CSV or TSV file. Any other files that are not TSV or CSV will throw a uh, you know notify them. And then once they do that, I'm going to have my user hit the action button. And once they hit that action button, it will filter the data. Then it will render a table of that data. And then we get to what we were talking about using that download handler if my user wants to actually download the view of that data. And so again, right here, what I'm doing is I have my download handler function. I have two arguments. I have the file name, which I provide a function. And all this does is it just creates the uh, file name that once it gets downloaded to inform my user of this is what the name of the file is going to be. And then it's going to write the CSV to their computer, which is going to be based off of the actual filter data object that, you know, is created. So that's big picture of what the application does. Let's see it in action. So here's just a simple filtering app. Um, so I'm going to go in here. I'm using this data called Midwest. It's from ggplot2. It's just population data for Midwest states or counties, counties within mid or counties 
within states that are in the Midwest. Um, this is the first question that I have for Kevin, because um, I know that this data only contains Midwest states. However, I had to use state abbreviations, so all these states are available. And this might come with dynamic UI, but what I wanted to do is I wanted to manipulate this input based on the states that are available. And so I wasn't able to figure that out. So, um, but maybe we can have that conversation and that's gonna come up. Um, so anyways, I know, I know Ohio's in there. So I'm just gonna use Ohio as an input. I'm gonna say, okay, I only wanna filter by population, which has a great, or a city that has a population greater than 200,000. I filter the data. Here's my table. All right, I like the view of this. So I'm gonna download it. And so it gets downloaded here onto my computer. You can see the file extension. I provided the state name, which is OH, population data. I can open it up and then there it is. There's that data available to me, okay? Um, but uh, again, I, I, and again, I'm gonna ask Kevin this question. This might come up in dynamic UI, but I had no idea how to manipulate this in the, the selections that are available based on what's in the data. I don't, do you have any idea, Kevin? I think I lost your mic. Can you go to your app real quick? Yeah, sure. I know I went through that kind of fast, but. Where's your input? So my input is up here for the select input. I just use the state abbreviations that's already available in R and I have to stop. Execution. You know what you can do? Try to go. Mm, oh, I've done this so many times. You could reference the CSV file and as the state go unique. State. Mm, and I lost your mic again, Kevin. Sorry. <laughs> You're making me question if I want to get Linux. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> there we go. Um. You could reference instead of state abbreviations because you you have all of them. You could do a simple just reference Midwest CSV and the state, and you go unique. Um. Okay. Um, and that will just limit your selections to. Um, huh. Yeah, I'll have to play around with that a little bit, but that makes sense because that was like was I was I was putting this together yesterday, and I was like I don't have time to figure this out, but I can shoot you a snippet. Yeah. For like inputs and just kind of like the framework of how I do it. Um, yeah, that would be great. That'd be good. Um, but again, you know, big picture here, if we want to give our users ability to do that, we have to use the download handler and we have to use the file name. Um, and go from there. So what other questions do people have in regards to downloading data? I, I've got a question, but I don't think it's gonna be anything that we should probably dig into. What what I was uh, mentioning, I've, I'm, I'm using another uh, person's uh, repository. It's uh, uh, the developer's name is, I could just send you the link to the GitHub, but, um, uh, his name is Roy Francis. So this developer, Mr. Francis, put together a shiny calendar app. And so this app, when it opens, allows the user to enter uh, uh, activities based on a start and stop time. Once that is is uh, at a point where you're you you like the output, then you can go down and select. Do you want it as a PDF? Do you want it as a PNG? Do you want it as a vector? Do you want it as a TIFF? And then when you hit the download button, the server, uh, the, the actual file hand or download handler generates the output. My problem was I wanted the PDF output to have a header and footer as well. And I, I, I was trying to understand or comprehend that download hand, handler and, and then any additional text you would put inside that function to uh, reference, you know, the title of the, the you know, app, uh, sorry, the title of the, the web page that you're using, um, you know, whatever uh, months that you were uh, viewing, and then, you know, as your output, actually create that as a header and footer, like, kind of like the, the, the version of, of 
when it was downloaded, that kind of stuff. Ryan, is that something you want to do? Well, I, I'm trying to do it for a project, and and I know that the cohorts and, and everything that I'm doing is kind of related to it, but it's my active point here. I'll just put it in the chat so everyone else can see that I'm being crazy. Um, the uh, this particular app, if, if he does have it on Shiny IO as a as a link, it takes a little bit for the server to start up, and, and you can interact with it. Um, I liked what he was doing, but I didn't. I there were changes that I wanted to make in relation to making it project oriented. And so whenever you take somebody's, you know, Brownfield app and then start to modify it, it's like, I don't know what this code is doing. I'm not really sure why it's here and how it's handling it. And so trying to deconstruct it to reconstruct it for my own purposes got a little bit too busy. This download function was, I had something that I was happy with, but then I needed to figure out how to put a header and footer on it. And that's where I lost it. Could I know it, yeah. I was going to say, when I do, I do a markdown document okay. and um, I put footers and when I do footers and headers, I just use HTML in the markdown document and it'll download. Um, you can get a lot of that metadata. Yeah, in uh, a, that's a good point. Yeah, just use it as a markdown. Doc. Would that have any effect, Kevin, on the... Uh, if I were to use Pandoc to generate the PDF, because I, I know at the at the core of what it's doing, it's it's Pandoc to translate from Markdown into into uh, PDF. But I would say I think I'm like in my example, my downloads are always HTML, okay. and sometimes uh, rendering PDF can be challenging, especially right. When Exactly. Yep. Yep. I agree hundred percent. And that's why I didn't, I'm only opening it up, Colin, because it was related to this particular chapter of Shiny and, and with the cohort, uh, as a, as a group, um, everyone has uh, uh, different ways of approaching the same problem kind of concept. So, no, I, I think that was a great question. And I mean, I think yeah. that's a good segue into the next part right here, which is downloading reports, you know, and, um, <clears throat> this was this was kind of neat and I don't think this directly answers your question I have an idea of what I might do with that and again I don't have a lot of experience with this um, you know with the outputting like a different report outside of being able to do the example apps and be like wow this is really cool um, but I was thinking that you know you capture that metadata and you use you know either those params that's available through our markdown or figure out a way to do it and adding LaTeX into that R markdown. But again, that might be a very naive way of doing it. And so uh, that's just for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, LaTeX, uh, that's a good comment, Colin. LaTeX code actually transposes using math, uh, math Uh So the interpreter, if you were to use LaTeX, Pandoc is also, uh, uh, that has a, a LaTeX uh, interpreter as well. Um, let me hear that. I'll, I apologize. I'll send a link real quick for what pan docking. No, you're good. Um, but um, while you do that, um, just kind of talk about this with like the ability to download reports. Um, it really kind of comes down to here's kind of the basic diagram that I've kind of put together in my mind is like the user provides inputs. Um, you know, this, they could say like inputs, like, you know, whatever input it may be. They want to generate a report. They click the um, you know download button for the report. Those list of parameters get wrapped up into like a list, and then they get sent to get rendered using R Markdown as parameters, which are in the YAML header for that specific document. And then those parameters are ran in the document to whatever you want to do in your analysis, and then it outputs whatever output you want, whether that be HTML, PDF whatever file type you want it to be, whatever, you know, you know, Markdown can do. So, um, and like I said, I'm, I'm still getting used to this part right here. I understand the parameters part, but the output part, that's, yeah, that's beyond, that's above, <laughs> that's getting above what I know. Well, check out that Pandoc because that's at the core. Uh, do you remember, uh, I want to say it was four weeks ago. Uh, Shane had mentioned a comment, uh, I think in the cohort, I was just watching the video, but um, I think at the time I, I hadn't, I wasn't part of the, the, the uh, activity. 
he had made a comment about his R studio and not rendering uh, Markdown properly, or he was trying to do book down. Maybe there was a statement that he made during our call. And I wanted to, to jump in and, and reply back to him at that point, because it was just his version of R studio uh, by updating the, uh, the uh, uh, general or the, the base R, then it would start to recognize those other, I, I knew the exact error he had, but um, check out Pandoc. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of the Swiss army knife, kind of like 7-zip would be for archive files. Pandoc is like your uh, one-stop shop of, of transposing from one media type to another media type. And um, uh, a lot of our tools uh, rely on these, um, you know, ephemeral open source projects that are built into the function calls that we talk about in our cohort. But here, if you want to know more about it here, this is another project that you can kind of uh, go off into time with learning as well. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, you know, I've heard of Pandoc as like the, you know, the way to make it, you know, turn it from R markdown into PDF. And so, um, but what's nice about that, and, and from what I'm hearing you say is, is that like Pandoc provides a lot of interpreters for other different languages that you can use within that R markdown document. Like if you want to use LaTeX and for people that aren't familiar with LaTeX, it's just a, um, it's just another programming language, but, and again, I don't know a lot about LaTeX, but it's a programming language to help you format documents and, and write mathematical notation and stuff. So, um, I know that's a very base statement, so don't send me any hate mail or any, um, bad Twitter things because I'm sure LaTeX is very powerful and I just don't know enough about it. So, um, so let's, let's, let's take this other example for a spin here. Um, this is not my example. This example was already provided to us, um, but I think it's kind of nice because it shows how to actually create a file. And there's some stuff that the person who created this, um, which is interesting and in how and how they do it. Um, but the biggest thing is is trying, or some of the biggest things that you want to notice about this is is that it's they create this function that passes along all the elements into our markdown render which will create the actual report. It will actually output it to the user's computer. Um, and so here's all the different arguments for it. The one that I really wanna highlight is this params argument. So what's gonna happen is, is that the user is gonna provide inputs into their, through their application or the interaction with the application. Those are gonna be wrapped up into a list and passed into, a per, into as parameters and then it's going to get sent to an R markdown file, which is, which is an important thing to know if you're going to have an, an, uh, a report get outputted, you need to have a .rmd file that gets used to create the report. And in this case, it's a very simple, simple report. Um, I mentioned the YAML header. Um, this is metadata for the actual report itself for when it renders, it uses this metadata to render it. And in params, these are like variables that get pulled into the document. And so what happens is, is that we have this parameter called dist and this parameter called n. These get passed along into the code right here and also in line here as well in the report um, so that when it renders, it has those inputs and automatically runs. So, and, and so basically, I'll just kind of go over this real quick. Here's all the inputs. All this is really going to do is it's going to give us the ability to change our selection for a different type of data distribution we want. It allows us to change the size of our sample. And then it gives functionality for the download button to generate the report. And it's the same thing. We use this function called download handler. And we provide a file name. And this is where... This is the example that kind of went away from the book because it doesn't technically provide a function. It just provides a string for the report. But if you wanted to have flexibility in how those files are named, you would use a function here. And then here's the content. And then what this content func or here's the content, here's the function for it to which we provide this file argument. It takes those parameters, wraps them in a list. So you can see here's our first input, which is the distribution. What distribution do you want? Here's the N, which is the size of our sample. And so these get wrapped up into a list, get passed into this separate file, which is 
the parameters in the YAML header, and then these parameters get passed along into your into your uh, document that you're creating, and then it gets rendered. Um, and then there was a discussion, and, and we could talk about it more here in a little bit after I kind of show how this works, but it talks about that you should run this in a separate R session. Um, I didn't really fully understand it. I kind of understand it, but I didn't. But this part right here, what it's going to do is it's going to run it in a separate R session. But we can talk about that here in a second. I just kind of want to show this because we're kind of running up on time here. But here's the application, really simple application. You just select what type of distribution you want. Let's just say I want a normal distribution. I want, I don't know, let's just do 850 samples for this distribution. It generates my report, gives me a little notification. This specific app does it as an HTML file, which I can open up in my browser and you can see what gets created. Because we had those parameters that were wrapped up in that list passed on to that, that RMD file, you can see that it has the type of distribution that I have right here in the random section. I wanted to point at it because I can't highlight it. And then the size of our sample. And then it created that plot based on our inputs. Here's our N and then um, and the distribution because we wanted a normal distribution. So I know that was really fast. So what questions can I answer? Does anybody have any comments about how we download a report? I thought this was super cool. I was like, this is really cool. <laughs> yeah, I think it's super cool too. I'm like imagining the projects that I need this for. And <clears throat> instead of just two inputs, I've got like 50 inputs. And instead of, you know, one plot in the end, I've got like a series of 18 different plots. So you got to figure out how to spin it all up, but it's nice to know that it can be done. I was going to say, really master learning how to do parameterized reports first. Otherwise, you're going to go spinning in circles. I don't know. It took me forever. It took me a good solid year to get a grasp of it. But once you have it, it's yours. <laughs> but if you need any resources on doing parameterized reports, I'm your guy because I've studied this. I may hit you up then for at least to get down the road a little bit. Um, Cause I remember reading it when in some, maybe in some other book club or when I was trying to do our markdown separately and uh, it never quite got off the ground for me, but I get the idea, but uh, I need some practice with it. So. The way I've thought about it is it's just, it's like a variable, right? But it's a variable that you're capturing outside of the like, document environment right um where's and, the code and, sorry where's the code that launches or that connects the app to the r markdown so it's going to oh, be the app right so it's going to be well i mean it comes up here right so like it runs this thing called r markdown render uh -huh. and to which that you provide uh, and I'm not totally familiar with this, but basically what you're doing is you're providing the input, which is probably the file path to the R markdown. You're telling it what output file, like where do you want to output it? Here are the parameters. And then I'm guessing this is taking in the environment variables, but someone correct me if I'm wrong. And so this is the code that renders that markdown document. But that's just a function that you put in bef ahead of even before the UI. And then do you call that function later? No, that's in the server. Well, I mean, here's the function right here, right? Like we define the function outside of the UI yeah. and then we call oh, it. Yeah, call it in. Oh, I see. Okay. You can also put it in your server too, I think. Yeah, that's well, this is what threw me off because this again, this isn't my example. This was already available. And I was sitting there, I was like, well, this is kind of confusing because you got to keep this, you know, like, well, first you're defining it up here. Yeah. And then I keep mine in my server. So that's what threw me off when I said that. I was like, oh, it's outside. <laughs> but yeah. well, so, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. Well, so then if you scroll down into the server section, you've got call R, this is line 46. You've got an R on line 46. You've got an, a function called R. Yeah. So this was where I got kind of lost. And what I understand in the book is it's like you're creating, you're running this in a separate 
our session. And, and again, like if somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but like call R allows you to run a separate session to render that markdown. So it's like starting a whole nother like R studio uh, session. Uh, I think a better way to state that Colin, not to correct, but I think the word is kernel. You're starting another R kernel instance to render this. Uh, I, it would mean the same context as, as a session or R studio or R session. But yeah, I think it's, it's another kernel that's running side by side that's in, uh, accepting these processes and then uh, 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 outputting it. So call R is just creating that next instance. You're telling it it's going to be an R kernel and then here run this render report function. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a better way to put it. And, and please correct me because sometimes I'm real fast and loose because like I have nope. mental models and so I, I, you know, a lot of it's half baked. So uh, <laughs> definitely correct me. <laughs> well, I was gonna, I was gonna also comment, Kevin. Correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm not interpreting this properly. Uh, Colin, do you mind scrolling up to the yeah. uh, our markdown render call? So inside the parentheses of your input, output file, params, and environmental uh, variable, within those four points, that is what creates your YAML extension on report.rmd. Uh, so if you go to the next tab, uh, report RMD, that is the four points, right? I, I guess it doesn't have the the uh, environmental on there. Maybe I'm incorrect then. Never mind. Um, scratch my statement. Sorry. I thought the the four render R markdown variables that you had listed there would create that YAML call uh, at the top of that point, but I yeah, I don't think I'm not seeing the same. Yeah, and I think this is just the YAML that you create. So, I mean, you you have it. I think I kind of think of it as like a template. Like you just have a template that's on the side. But that's again, I mean, I we 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 actually created our first parameterized report at work, and so <laughs> outside of like an application. So I'm still learning this too. So, um, but that's a good point. And um, there's a there actually I saw there's like an R community meetup that's going to do um, like a Zoom call for, and I, and I don't want to go over time because I see we're already at 704, but it's a, it's a specific special or a specific, specific session that covers um, parameterized business reports. And so I will definitely be at that one. So I encourage you to join in because those sessions are usually pretty good. Do you, uh, do you have that link, uh, uh, Colin? I will find it and I will okay. put it into the Slack because I don't have it immediately. So, but yeah, it's, and those community meetup groups are usually really good because they're put on by our studio and they usually have some really good presenters. And if you're interested in this topic and going a little bit further, I would definitely check it out. Thank I think I'm going to have, I think I'm going to have one of my student workers jump in on it too. Cause I'll be like, this is what you're going to be doing. So <laughs> learn this. And Kevin, Kevin is the keynote speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, that's all I have. I mean, I can hang out and work through a couple more things if people have any more questions, but I guess, I, guess I, you know, I don't want to hold anybody if they have other obligations, but um, that's chapter nine. So um, Dyna dynamic UI is next. And I, uh, Colin, when you and I were speaking, I couldn't remember what chapter I had dedicated to. Uh, is it next week or is it going to be uh, uh, chapter 11, I guess? Uh, well, we'll do we'll do chapter ten, and, and uh, Kevin actually brought up a good point earlier in the week. If yeah. we should split it because it's pretty long, so it I mean, I'm, I'm three. It can take three. I'm serious. That's that's a lot there, and that's okay too. Like we totally can split it up into three too if we need to. Um, I mean, I mean, if you want to take part of it, Ryan, like that's cool too. Or if you want to work with somebody, like I'm cool with that too. I don't want to put all the burden on you to put it all together. So I hadn't presented in a while. So I was, I was trying to uh, offer services, uh, keeping everybody moving and, and allowing him to jump over. Um, the, uh, I was going to add a statement uh, in the EPGS earlier today with Russ um, there, we were talking uh, not, Goal, but it was just simplicity. The whole entire discussion, Frederica was our presenter, but she was talking about the simplicity of building the app. 
And uh, that was kind of mind blowing. It's it's kind of expect the unexpected from your user. Uh, Kevin, you've already <laughs> mentioned that uh, with with completely blasting away database tables. But then uh, the second was uh, uh, not just keeping it simple, but like it's 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 value added simplicity. So uh, like one of the questions they had was, you know, does the person really need to see eighteen thousand lines of a of a CSV file that you just ingested? Uh, you know, that's kind of like, no, that's probably not really worthwhile. Uh, it's, it's no value added. So why put that uh, on the, uh, on the uh, output side? Anyway, it, it ties together, I guess, is I, I'm putting both, uh, both cohorts together, I guess. No, I mean, that's a good, I mean, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, what, what's the concept they call it? Yangy? You ain't going to need it? Is good point. that what it is? Or is that the, method, is that the yeah. official like programmer <laughs> developer term for something? Yes, method. Uh, keep it simple. Uh, that's another another way of saying it too. <laughs> so, um, how about how about this? So, Ryan, if you're interested in taking it, how about you see how far you get? Like maybe put together something for an hour, and then right. or like maybe maybe just kind of judge what you think what an hour could take, and then like post out in the Slack and say like this is as far as I get in one session. And then we can maybe go from there. Does that work for everybody? Sure. Cool. And I could jump in too. Like if, you know, I can jump in too to help out as well. And, and anybody else who wants to help is more than welcome to, but yeah, we could split it up. I think that's a good idea. Um, the, the end, it gets into functional programming and I'm like, wow, it's really cool, but uh, tough stuff. It's funny, I was looking at the chapters today and I was like, whoa, we're almost done with this. And then we have, what is it? Uh, like deep dive into reactives. And then, and then the last one, then there's like another section that's like miscellaneous or something. I'm like, we're almost done. There's only two big sections left, except they're really big sections. So we're really not that really not that close to being done. But um, I was just going to mention too, I'm happy to jump in. The only thing is I, I probably need one more week uh, break. So, so I won't be able to present on the 6th. And then the 13th, I think I'm going to attend, but probably I've got something else that on the 13th, I think I can make it to the session, but I probably can't present on that. But I'll jump back in on October 20th or something. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't feel obligated. I mean, you know, the responsibility goes back on me, so it's not, it's not that big a deal. And, and so, um, okay. but yeah, take whatever you can and uh, we'll go from there. Cool. Cool. Well, that's all I have. If you guys want to keep hanging out and talk about this stuff, it's cool. If not, <laughs> have a good rest of your night. I'm not pushing anybody away, but. See you guys. I think I'm good. Thanks, Kevin. See ya. Take it easy, Thanks, guys. Everyone.